Daniel Marfi, how are you, sir? All right, how are you, and how's your wife? My wife is quite good. Thank you for asking. She's good. So I'm a toothless wonder today, see? Oh, wow. Yeah, my, my tooth fell out last night. Gosh, you're always incurring <laughs> bad fortune in my, in my time with you. How, what, yeah. did you, were, you, were you biting on something dangerous? Uh, I don't think I don't think bread is very dangerous, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yep, I took a bite out of a piece of uh, sourdough bread, and I'm like, that's a little crunchier than I expected that crust Ouch. to be. And Ooh. boom, yeah, here we are. So, <laughs> ouch, oh dear. So tomorrow, three o'clock, I'll be there. I'll be at is the dentist right? office. Yes, I'm going to turn another light on just to see. So is that, was that one tooth or two? It's quite big, that gap. It's <laughs> Thankfully, one, it? just one. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah. So we we won't be uh, we we won't be recording just now, rather than the the talk. <laughs> so so okay. Yeah. So uh yeah, but I have uh yeah the tooth is quite big though. So it's a veneer. I got it thirty years ago, Neil. So. Right. Yeah. So. Oh. 30 years it stayed there. Yeah. <laughs> and then yesterday it just magically came out at dinner time. Well, I'm and I'm glad you can get a replacement tomorrow. Yeah, me too. <laughs> or at least glued back in. So we'll see. So I had yeah. some temporary glue, but it only lasts 12 hours. And frankly, um, I don't sound any better with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, you don't sound too bad, I would say. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. But smiling would be. <laughs> well oh, i'm thinking spaghetti spaghetti would be easier to eat this way maybe I, I, maybe right or oatmeal you know something yeah. right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah look on, look on the bright side i'm trying you know i made my wife laugh because i'm like hey honey she's <laughs> like what is that i'm like my tooth is gone she's like no shit of course it is <laughs> so yeah and how's Ohio? Really good. Really good. People are very, very nice here. I'm uh, I, not that I expect them to be mean, to be clear, but they're even nicer than I thought they'd be. Oh. People are very kind. Um, the weather is, it's cooler, but not cold. Like it's still October and it's still 80 degrees, which is weird for, I get, I don't know. I'm, a, I'm from Wisconsin. So this is weird to me anyway. Yeah. Wisconsin's cold. It is. It is. Yeah, I've been to I've been to Madison for a long weekend. So there you go. Hmm. There you go. Yeah. What'd you do there? <laughs> I interviewed the founder of Provocative Therapy, a man called Frank Farrelly. Yes, exactly. So he uh, was trained as a therapist and social worker. And one afternoon, he was in this uh, the Mendota State Mental Hospital with one of the clients he'd been seeing for ninety occasions, and said, "Oh, shut up! You'll never get out of here." And the guy went, "Yes, I will." And he thought, hang on, that's the first time he's actually been assertive and kind of spoken up for himself. So he thought he's onto this. So he, he used humor to bring out the best in people. So he said, I know the, the answer for them, the solution is within them, and let me tease it out of them. So literally, you want to give up smoking? No, no, no. You want to smoke more? That's the problem. And you go, oh, do I? What? Um, so you, it, it's kind of teasing them. by. All, he says you're holding up a... A, a weird hall of mirrors to people to help them bring out the solution perhaps that's within them that they can enact themselves. Wow, that's so interesting. It, that's uh, like Patch Adams, right? A little yeah, bit? exactly, exactly. And you're using humor. You're not just saying, oh, you know, so your life is terrible. It'll go on being terrible. Your mother was terrible. Your father was this. Uh, come back next week. It's kind of saying, confront what's holding you back. And it's, he calls it satirizing your self-limiting beliefs. So, and I use it a lot because if you say something to somebody that kind of go, you sort of tease them. Of course, nobody likes you, whatever. You, you're about to get the sack. And am I? And, and they kind of say, and of course, I, you, you have to tread carefully because what you hope is that everyone says, well, he's not going to get the sack. Of course, uh, that's right. But, but bring out a little bit of the truth by coming at it obliquely, making outrageous uh suggestions to people that then they tell you well actually the truth is this or because when i'm working with a um a group i'll say you know who's the new who's the fairy godmother who who's the stepmother 
the evil stepmother or the new king and stuff like that. And very quickly, they'll go, yeah, I can see that unusual way of looking at things actually has more truth than a more conventional way. Sure. Oh, that's so interesting. So, um, yeah, that's so interesting. Like Paul Sloan talks about lateral thinking. This is oblique thinking. This is interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's um, fascinating because I've, I've seen Frank Farrelly do it uh, in real life. And you have therapists and coaches watching and he'll look at the person they recorded uh, audio um, and he'll just give them lots of eye contact, lots of nonverbal reassurance, but sort of tease them. And then you can see at some point when they kind of go, ah, something's been unlocked where they know. Ah, that's what it is. It's I've been saying this all along, and actually I know the truth was this. Uh, do I really want to give up cigarettes? Yes, I do. Uh, but I've been telling myself a certain story that hasn't empowered me to do that. Huh. So so how did you get called in to interview him? <laughs> well, I was working. Um, I went to a day at the comedy store uh, uh, where the kind of academic research into comedy so there were sociologists psychologists and so forth but there was also a comedian i knew who was working with a general practitioner and homeopath um and i wrote to them i said can i get involved so I, we became the academy of laughter and health and the doctor played me on a cassette uh, his session with frank and where well, he was complaining about his sister or his mother-in-law or something like that and it was funny because Frank kept teasing him. Well, you know, of course they don't want to hang out with you. You're a loser. <laughs> and the person's just laughing. And Brian, who's my friend, uh, he just said, I, I kind of could see the world more clearly because he was giving me these oblique references, if you like, um, and not playing the game, but teasing me. And so I, I wrote this up for a radio idea. Let's look at the, the beneficial uses of comedy help people better patch adams being one is that if, if you laugh you're really getting a lot of oxygen there there's all sorts of endorphins and so forth so i sent this to my literary agent and he said i like this frank farrell guy go meet him so i rang a, i rang him up and within two minutes he said you can come and stay with us i said well you might be i i might be a serial killer <laughs> you can't just invite me he said you might be but i've got i've got a colt 45 and he had a whole bunch of guns in his in his house so <laughs> i went and i i landed i via chicago landed at uh madison and i was looking around where's the guy and there was this guy who looked like father christmas but in a, a green bay packers outfit <laughs> kind of are you are you here yeah I, are you him yeah okay so uh he i stayed with him for a long weekend i um he just chatted for a while i took lots of notes i went drove around, I went to look at Madison, I went to the Mendota State Hospital, just to have a look, and this is where it happened. He told me about all sorts of stories about, even one time somebody said, I wanna commit suicide. He said, do you really? Uh, when? Well, it's often, okay, fine. Can I have your cigarettes and your wallet? Cause you won't be needing them. And the man was, huh? And of course this is dangerous. And others were unsure whether this was authentic and ethical, uh, but he had, very good results if you like uh people did come out of those moments um you know somebody said uh you know i'm jesus he said that's good i'm god so how are you son and that kind of thing where it's kind of like improv that i do which is you take one thing somebody gives you you throw it back to them with a little bit more added and that's how we create scenes and so it's very akin to my world if you like uh he was also he said how do you you know what qualifies you to be to do this and he said you know be born irish <laughs> luckily i have irish ancestry but what he meant by that he said you'd have to open heart chakra and a twinkle in your eye what he meant by that was it's not just teasing it's not just making the person feel uneasy because you have a lot of non-verbal you're really looking at them he often touched people on the shoulder on the knee you can do it sort of thing where it was kind of we knew this was a game and then he'd stop it and then say okay now back to normal how was it for you that moment and they would say yeah, i could feel my voice rising i was get, getting a bit angry when you kept telling me that it was my fault that my mother-in-law was an idiot or whatever um and so that was the journey so i wrote this article and we managed to, we didn't sell it uh in the end nor the radio idea but i got very keen and, and uh, frank came to the netherlands and i saw him talking to a lot of coaches uh and visited a few times and then 
there's lots of exercises you can do uh, which kind of use the techniques, uh, which is sometimes you exaggerate the problem, sometimes you minimize the problem. Sometimes you says research says, you know, anybody called Jeff will never give up smoking. It's it's written there. And and they're having, uh huh. And that, again, your tea, and they're smiling and going, hang on a minute. My my internal logic has told me I will never overcome this problem. And there may be some comfort in that, which is living. I'm I see myself as a victim, and uh, that's great, and I know where I am with that. Whereas Frank was saying, let's confront this. Do you really want to overcome what you identify as the issue? That's cool. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. So, so how did you get started in improv, man? <laughs> I was doing a show at uh, a small theater in London, a pub theater, above a pub, just very low rent, uh, with my friends from the Cambridge Footlights. So this is Cambridge University. Hugh Laurie, Emma Thompson, Stephen Fry, mm. Sasha Baron Cohen, Olivia Coleman, Monty Python. You know, there's a long tr tradition there, and that's what I wanted to do. And I thought that's the way I do it without I get a degree as well in economics and social science just in case. And uh, I can show my parents I've done the right thing. But also this is what I want to do. Um, so we were doing the show, the Cambridge Full Lights, and Mike Myers had just come to England. Didn't know anybody, but his parents are British, so he could he could work here. So he, he saw Cambridge Foot Lights on our poster and knocked on the door and said, uh, can I can I help? And they said, oh, yeah, you can paint the set. Uh, you can sell tickets. So I met him. He was selling tickets. We got talking and of course he's funny and i said what are you doing here and i'm writing sketches like, nobody's writing sketches it's all stand up now and where are you from well, he said I, I come from second city canada second city i said you mean like saturday night live you mean like the blues brothers yes he said well i was amazed and not many british people had heard of second city whereas i had because i loved i loved the blues brothers spinal tap and i knew this convention so we started playing together little uh sketches the two of us and then he taught me improv and we founded the comedy store players and that's i'm still part of that so that's mike would teach us these skills along with a woman called kid hollerbach who'd been in san francisco with robin williams and others so they brought the north american tradition to us taught us this uh, and then mike had to go back to canada uh, he was called back to join the toronto main stage his father was unwell so we had to kind of Mike's not here anymore. We've got to do it on our own. And that was really good for us. Initially, it was terrifying. Um, but Mike had taught us the rules. Say yes. Establish in any scene who, what and where, because only from those details can you get story. You're not creating jokes. You're creating story from that. And from characters will flow humor um, and the basic listen, accept what the other person says. Yes. And and trust the process and you'll go to places you didn't expect that's so interesting i just finished uh listening to martin short's uh autobiography uh uh i must say i think it was called or i don't remember what it's called it was so good and it he talks about that that his second his uh second city experience as well in toronto yeah, well, it was Mike went back to Second City, Toronto, I think, because it's some anniversary of the Toronto troupe. And Martin Short was there and came running up to him and said, you're great. And he rang Lorne Michaels at Saturday Night Live and said, you must have this guy. Uh, so thanks to Martin Short. And so I think there was, there's a lot of Second City that um, people have learned from. Uh, they've learned these basic skills. Mike was touring as well. So he was taking sketches. Uh, a scripted show all around Canada to the most unusual places. You're playing tough crowds. You're doing corporate gigs. You, you know, uh, not straightforward events either. So you learn a lot. You learn um, about how to create sketches as well, because the the improv sometimes leads to written sketches. How to tr how to work with others who may have differing points of view and differing skills. Wow, wow! So you learn from one of the best. That's pretty cool. I, I'm going to say I learned from the best. Uh, so, yeah. so first of all, Mike, not Mike is naturally funny, but secondly, he had been very well taught and he would continually drop the names of people from Second City, Toronto and Chicago. People who are uh, who not necessarily public names now, but just a great direct Del Close, for example. Um, the people who taught him were really uh, dedicated the art of of this, how to create theater in the moment that had truth. Uh, had story 
and were funny as well, but not funny in a jokey, easy, out-group way. It was kind of finding a deeper truth. And uh, that certainly would be how I would characterize that, that school of theatre. Wow. That's so interesting. So, um, yeah, that that's so cool, man. That's so interesting. I, that's yeah, something that I want to uh, study more, too. Well, I think uh, the thing is, occasionally I persuaded podcast hosts to go do an improv show. Sometimes they say, it's not my thing, I can't do it. And I say, of course it's your thing. You listen. You, mm-hmm. you give somebody else the platform. I- improv, often the... Mm, um, emotion, um, mindset is how do I make the other person look good? That is it. And if you're both doing that, you create a great show and the audience can see that collaborative endeavor, even though we didn't expect that she was going to say that or it might, I might say this, but that openness and vulnerability and shared fallibility is counterintuitively really engaging with an audience that knowing that we would make it up. Quite different from a scripted show, which is the audience goes, wow, that's a great piece of writing. What a great moment of acting that was whereas improv is more throwaway more in the moment yeah that's interesting yeah I, it will be something i do for sure <laughs> so i just have uh yeah i just have to figure out when yeah Being here I'm... in ohio you know it's it's uh i'll look i'll look i'll look around maybe i'll go back to chicago because i'm from milwaukee um so i've been you know I, i've i've been to chicago lots of times and i have friends that have done that and i've played comedy sports kind of accidentally right i get pulled on stage stuff like that so i enjoy that i I like improv and your point i definitely see that podcasting is it's all for me anyway it's all improv like i don't write down 10 questions i i know the first thing and then i know and then i know the last thing and then we tell the story together yeah and sales is improv that's right isn't it it's kind of what's what's their need Oh, it's not what I expected. It's not the same as that customer. I I know I have some good stuff, but let me hear what they see and maybe missing or wanting. Ah, yes, I can see how that is. You're not saying, look, I've got a suitcase of stuff, yes or no. You're kind of trying to work out what they need, when they need it, uh, how you could express that that makes sense to them. So sales is definitely improv because it's listening, listening. Yeah. And being, well, being present, being present yeah. and, and, and the whole, you know, body language, leaning in, leaning out, leaning around, you know, <laughs> straightening glasses, all that stuff. I like leaning around. Tell me more about leaning around. Yeah. Well, so sometimes, right, people, sometimes people lean in or lean back, but sometimes people, they move over. Yeah. And they're really thinking differently if you're, if you get them to do that, because the in and the out, sometimes that's just rocking. Right. But some people like the full lean in is is powerful. But if they're leaning around and they lean, you know, like this, they often unconsciously they're they're really shifting their mind, not just their body. Interesting. Interesting. And a bad salesperson at that point jumps in with a solution. And I think the the best salespeople are happy with a pause because there's some reflection going on there. and. I don't need to throw my next sales piece of sales collateral in. I need to just let them digest, reiterate, articulate what it is they're, they're noticing. Yeah. It's a good time to ask a question. Yeah. So what are you thinking, Neil? Like, yeah. what, what's going on there? Yeah. Exactly. Um, and that's when they might tell you, I don't like it, or this is, I don't like this bit of it. Whereas if you're trying to keep telling them why they do like it, now why they should like it, and here's seven more reasons, I can see that that would be counterintuitive, counterproductive. And that's certainly mm-hmm. the same thing. So, so that's the thing about improv is about listening, taking time, leaving moments. Sometimes the best improv is the silence, the body language, the eyebrow, the step back where we we create meaning about the interaction of the characters their emotion their status what's just emerged what could happen now the pregnant pause uh, all of those things are you know they're acting but the improviser the improv tra- practitioner is aware that that's part of their armory yeah so how how do we how do we learn those neil 
How did you learn those? I mean, is it just as easy as Michael said, here's what you do or what? <laughs> well, like um, I was thinking about this today, that improv is like a sport, really. You can get better at it. A martial art may be. It's, you can understand it intellectually, but you're not going to get better at it unless you get in the water and swim uh, and get on the bike, fall over. You do it by experiencing it. And I dare say nearly everything, you have to do it a few times. Maths, English, French, any language. Have a go, get it wrong, go back. Oh, yes, somebody's there to help you. And that's what Kit Hollaback and Mike are really excellent teachers. They would model and then they would step back. We'd have a go. We might make a mess of it. But actually, sometimes you appreciate the mess is actually a great choice. <laughs> Somebody not knowing means they say something they didn't mean to say, which could be a brilliant piece of theatre. And that's for for newbies. That's that's the learning is you have to kind of empty yourself rather than think of a good line, a great joke, a, a brilliant plot insight. It's kind of just maybe repeat what the other person said or take a pause or come back to what happened earlier. Just that confidence to let the process go with you. So, Mike. Uh, Mike and Kit just let us practice. We did workshops. We did a show. We did a workshop. We did a show. We did a workshop. There was plenty of just getting on the horse. And um, improv is the kind of activity where we talk about choices. You could say that's a great choice. That's a not so good choice. But you never know, really, at the time. Was it great to call him um, a chicken? Maybe he was actually Mr. S Mr. Watkins, the school teacher. We don't know. We went with chicken that time. It was fine for them. And you and hindsight you might say, but you can't rewrite. You know, life is not a rehearsal. Improv is not a rehearsal. If you are doing a scripted piece, you will rehearse, try and things back and forth. And once you accept that kind of there is no going back and try and create the positive movement forward, even when she doesn't know what to say or I'm completely stuck or I've been called a chicken. I don't want to be a chicken. Hang on, I'm going to be a chicken. I'm going to be the best chicken there was. And I've got to find out why my chicken likes your chicken or is scared of your chicken or who's the fox in the, in the chicken coop. That kind of thing where you're kind of thinking, how do I make story out of this? So that you learn by doing. Yeah, Say, well, sales is much the same. You can, you can do as much as role play as you want, but until you actually get a, a prospect or a client on the phone, it's very hard. Very hard to do. Exactly. And you, uh, with improv, there's a more complex one, and then there's the performance games. So by the time you get to the performance, you're feeling okay. And certainly the people have told me about sales, uh, things like they, when they were very young, junior, they went out with somebody else. They noticed that that easy opportunity for a sale, the person didn't take because they were thinking more about the relationship. Um, that the, the it's simple but quite complicated. Listening is is hard because <laughs> I want to say something, um, and I'm worried about the pause. And I know I've got some great sales stuff in my suitcase, but when do I say it? Or actually, if there is silence, maybe I do say it. But just sometimes, what are you thinking is a great question, isn't it? So that seems to me that uh, it, it, it's some, these are both areas, like many, you can only do, uh, learn by doing. And it's quite nice to be with people who've done it already and see how they might come away saying, oh, I didn't sell that. Uh, oh, I should have said that. Oh, no, they're tough. But, you know, next year, something may come from that. Yeah. And, and again, salespeople say to me, sometimes all you're doing is selling the next meeting. That's all. Just let's come back. Uh, or in, for example, I work with a lot of management consultants. I work with tech firms. And the initial meeting could be just saying, this is who we are. This is what we do. Next time, I'll bring my data scientists with me. Next time, I'll bring that specialist who knows so much about this world. I wouldn't bring them first time because I want to just unearth what it is that you care about what you might think the problem is turns out the problem isn't what you thought perhaps or maybe i need to investigate that with a technical person but um i remember always be closing <laughs> and a friend of mine uh we came up with always be connecting you know 
it, that's yeah. it. Just make a because this person may not buy now. They may have a friend. They may have a colleague. They may not be in post any longer. And uh, that's definitely how uh, the I, I do my business. I'm just a one man person. And um, I've been to some meetings where it seemed to be warm and then it didn't happen. And then a year later, they come back and say, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was just there was a change of thing. There was a budget thing. Now here we are. And it's better. You know, it, like in theatre, when when you go to the Edinburgh Festival or you play Fringe Theatre off Broadway, there's seven people in the audience. We say those are the right seven people. Those those. Are, and I must do it. We must do it for them. We mustn't bemoan the 400 who weren't here. Um, and that's that's being present. That's being in the moment. And uh, again, the idea of improv is the offer, because sometimes those seven people will have such a good time. <laughs> Even better, you know, in terms of energy than the 70 people that uh, that may not be as fully satisfied. It depends on the uh, of the moment. Yeah, the right seven people. That isn't that all we all any of us want, right? I'd rather have the right seven people than the wrong 700. In a lot of cases, <laughs> though, I mean, for for ticket sales, it's nice to have 700 sales. <laughs> but well, you ultimately, know. you want to have the right 700. And, there you go. And, and uh, there you go. And that's exactly how you know branding. And uh, how do you how do you tell the story to those 700 that says this is for you? Uh, and, and there's always a fascinating thing. Do I just say what are 700 people like versus what do I like or what are seven people like? Actually, could the other uh, 693 <laughs> like it as well? Um, and this is art, I guess, or, or in any kind of new product, which is uh, trying stuff out um, and. The aim, I suppose, is to have the 700 people, but I'm always interested in, in niche products. I always admire also non-niche. You know, I've worked for very big global companies with massive factories selling thousands of product. Unilever, for example, and we, and we have to get this stuff shifted. We have to make it in different territories. Uh, people sort of see it as a human right to be able to have some of the personal care stuff they provide. Um, how do we um keep that going um, and i'm i'm glad i don't have to do it myself i just have to keep a few hundred people at the comedy store every sunday happy or people in my workshop uh and i'm i'm fine with that so but you wrote a book though man you wrote in the moment and and yes. the goal there was to reach more people right and so you know i mean because the book is in, in a lot of ways it, it's asynchronous right i don't have to uh, i don't i don't have to see you in person in order to pick up a copy of your book and learn from you. Is that, was that why you wrote it or what was the impetus there? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It was kind of over 25 years, I've been thinking about this and I've been doing it. So that was the, the point, which is, can I get this stuff into a book such that I don't have to be there to deliver it? And also to kind of validate myself in a way to, to say, look, I don't just show up and do improv jokes. I have a thesis, I have a, a reflexive, way of being which looks at my world of improv and looks at your world of work um, and and i've been taught by my participants that there are many applications that's that's the joy of this is and i've uh, and i found academics who have leadership models and stuff um and so it's been fascinating to me to learn how others are talking a similar language to me i'm talking improv on the stage and actually, I think listings help. Ah, oh, turns out there's a whole bunch of stuff, which is like uh, like what I do, which is basically most organizations are a series of improvised conversations. Most business is a bunch of improvised conversations between customers, suppliers, uh, marketing, IT, consultants, compliance, legal, whatever, uh, which may then help one organization become uh, what it is because of, of the internal conversations, responding to demand, market forces, technology regulation. There's a whole bunch of improvisation going on there. So why not learn from people whose job it is to do it on the stage and have a whole protocol uh, of trying to say, yeah, this is what's happening. Let's use it. Let's be consciously aware of what is occurring rather than uh, stick to a script that we wrote and it may not be applicable in this new environment. So the book really was, it's like we used to talk when I was at university about an essay crisis, which is kind of, you leave it to the last minute, you do it the night before you do it. You know, I used to get up at 4 a.m. to write for a 9 a.m. deadline. Terrible behavior, really. But I've had this hanging over me, which is 
when people say to me at the end of a workshop, can I read about this? And, and now I can say, yes, here you go. This is the thing. This, these are the chapters. This is one on improv. I explain the thesis. This is the one on leadership. This is the one on creativity. This is the one on storytelling. And I, you, I say as well, look, there are times when improv is not the thing. You need to be structured. You need to be prepared. Not least in the world of theater, I help people with presentation. So, so get rehearsing, get your ideas sorted, have a good start, have a good close. If you're standing in front of people, they expect you to be prepared. Um, have a script or bullet points, know your slides. Don't just look at the slides, uh, look at your audience. Um, on the other hand, when you're working with a colleague, perhaps who needs some coaching or it's a sales moment, you want to be a little less scripted. Um, you want to be using the skills of improv. The very worst thing is to try and improvise what should be prepared. Things like uh, agendas for teams meeting. We've got half an hour, 12 people. We've got seven things to get through. Don't just say, hey, let's just talk about what we feel like. No, you're wasting people's time if you're not prepared. I've seen very important chief executives do a presentation that was not prepared, that was messy. And I could see the audience going, what's this about? On the other hand, I've seen senior people who've really gone to troubles to create good slides, to be funny, to be entertaining, to be honest. And I'm looking around the audience and I'm thinking, you have just invested 18 months loyalty or, or created 18 months loyalty in this audience because of what you did in that 15 minutes. They're always going to remember that. And that 80 months were just plucked out of nowhere. It could be longer, but it's just that sense of, Ah, oh, right, they care about us. Whereas the, the, the ill-defined, hello, everybody, I'm the chief executive. I better say stuff. Well, thanks very much. Anyway, let me hand over. That's a negative message. So you need to be prepared, especially in, in hybrid. Uh, we don't want to spend all day on Teams and Zoom. So make, make it gender, have some side meetings, make sure everyone knows what they've got to say. Make sure it's OK that we're going to talk about this. Is this report prepared? Lots of preparation. And that's the thing about sales as well. You don't just show up. <laughs> yes, I'm saying you improvise, but you should have some stuff, some materials, some physical, an object, whatever it may be, um, some useful stories, for example, how this product was used, how it transformed somebody else's life or organization. Uh, that's fine. So, but that that is the dynamic in life. I would say in business, which is when do I script? When do I not? And that can change all but moment by moment. My chapter on leadership is sometimes leaders got to go do this, do this, do it by tomorrow. Uh, this is where we are. And that kind of directive leading is required. But doing that all the time means people begin to turn off. So you need to think about the improv thing, which is, OK, what are you guys feeling? What would you like to contribute? I don't know the answers. Actually, I know the answers to what happened last year, but the next 10 years, you just out of college, you'll have an idea. So that to me is, is, an, uh, is a dynamic that has to be understood. And too many, um, shall we say, trainings tend to be about communication as script, uh, strategy as straight lines rather than something more fuzzy, and sales as step one, step two, step three. Uh, the steps are helpful. Uncover customer needs. Good. Um, yada, yada. Uh, I've seen some very good sales where they don't just waffle on. How's your family? How's everything? <laughs> you know, you were there to sell. We all know that. Get to the point authentically. So there we go. That's uh, that's my book. It's called In the Moment. I, I have my cake and eat it because I say we create theatre in the moment. And sometimes that impromptu moment with a client, colleague, whatever, three seconds in the elevator at the end of a team's meeting could be crucial. Sometimes though, you've got to recognize that a moment could be six months in your life, uh, a year or three years as you begin to realize maybe you, you do want to be a leader or you don't want to be doing what you're doing now. And so I've I've um, I've, I've talked about the mind, you know, the mind doesn't remember things in a linear way, as you say, asynchronous. It's kind of um, I, I remember that period of my life in like a split second that I had when I was on vacation. It, it, it's kind of a story. Uh, so there we are. That's um, that's my book. It's called In the Moment. It's a build your confidence, communication and creativity at work. We did we did spend a lot of time saying, should we have the word improv in the title? Because because um, I do talk about improv. 
but also I talk about structure. And in, there have been some improv books. I almost called it Yes But, by the way. Yes But improv isn't always the answer. Ooh. It's the answer to some stuff and quite a lot of stuff, but not always. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, folks can get you more at neilmalarkey.com, which is super cool. They can get your book on Amazon or if they go to koganpage.com and use the, the code, uh, what is it, Kogan20, I believe? Hold on. Kogan page, Kogan 20. page 20. Yep. But Kogan, actually, yeah. you can find that on my website, Kogan Page That's 20. Right. You get the discount. Uh, there was periods where you could get the book and the digital version. They, they do those little promotions every now and again. But um, so it's a global go koganpage.com in the moment. Uh, but if you go to the website, Neil Malarkey, you'll find the, the special discount code. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff, Neil, as expected, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I want to meet you in real life. When will that happen? I don't know. Hopefully soon. You come Hopefully to London. Soon. I go to Ohio. Oh, uh, OK, how about I'll go to London while you're there and then come to Ohio when I'm here. That'll work that's, for me. OK, that's a better idea. Thank you. <laughs> sure. The recording that's has funny. stopped. So, yeah, so I didn't plan to do that. We just improv the rift it and went 30 minutes anyway. Yes, absolutely. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was, the, out of yeah. everybody neil i'm the least surprised that i would do that with you absolutely i i wasn't sure where we we're going but i enjoyed going there with you yeah, also same. uh when you listen back i think you'll hear your tooth by the way oh i hope not <laughs> but i do want to see a picture of you having some spaghetti or something in that little gap i think that would yeah be there you go something right <laughs> that's funny that is funny so wow Cool. So, hey, so, so, uh, so, so speaker flow, you've been on our list for a long time. What do you know about us? Well, I, I did a podcast, um, talking to the guys and, and they were great. And I, I, I just liked the way that speaker flow had sort of looked at this as a, something you can scale, you can use data. It, it doesn't have to be just, um, informal, which is probably how many of us do it hoping things will work and stuff, you know, using whatever CRM, thinking about how to how to promote this and applying a bit of intelligence, a bit of science, a bit of data. Yeah. So it's fascinating. Yeah. I think so too. I just started here a month ago and it's interesting to me too. It's a, the the business of speaking is so fascinating that it that to your point about being both scripted and and improvisational, it's really that's really the key. You know, there's no right words, but certainly you have to kind of know what you're going to talk about. Yeah. So you've got to be prepared and you've got to be prepared to throw away the script. And sometimes you've got to be fully scripted. In fact, I think it was, yeah, it was those the guys from Speaker Flow where I'm, I actually, I don't know if I actually, at, on the on the occasion, they did say, yeah, I believe in improv now because a lot of people say I can't do improv. And but by the end, I'd said, you can do it. And they, they agreed. I don't know if they have. I'm hoping I should... Um, Send them a little nudge saying, have you done some improv? Maybe maybe now with Gerby Shack on board, you can have the speaker flow improv night. There you go. Yeah, for sure. I'd play. I'll, I'll <laughs> set it up. Maybe. So, yeah. When Well, when we hit a million dollars, we're going to BAMF. So maybe we'll do it there. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. I've, I'm sure there's a good improv theater in BAMF, actually. That's the kind I'm of place sure there is. Yeah, no, for sure. Tour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. Well, thank you oh, so man. much. And let me know when, uh, you know, when this goes out. And I'll... <laughs> I will. I will. I'll see how much I, I don't, I don't think I'm going to edit it. It's funny the way it is, I think. Fine. And say hi to the guys as well. We, I think I we met maybe Christmas 2021 or even something like that. But uh, Oh, cool. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, on, on. Um, no, no, on, online. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, online, yeah. But again, I said you must come to London. So. Yes. Well, I've I've never been, funny enough, I've lived in uh, Korea for a year, but I've never been to Europe. My goodness me, that that's a shame. But Yeah, uh, I no, I agree. I agree. That's day. my purpose. Absolutely. <laughs> for sure. Okay, well, I hope to meet you then. And good luck with uh, the dentist tomorrow.